Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Lord, Peter approached Jesus and asked him, Lord, if my brother sins against me, how often must I forgive? As many as seven times. Jesus answered, I say to you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. That is why the kingdom of heaven may be likened to a king who decided to settle accounts with his servants. When he began the accounting, a debtor was brought before him who owed him a huge amount. Since he had no way of paying it back, his master ordered him to be sold, along with his wife, his children, and his property, in payment of the debt. At that, the servant fell down, did him homage, and said, Be patient with me, and I will pay you back in full. Moved with compassion, the master of that servant let him go and forgave the loan. When that servant had left, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a much smaller amount. He seized him and started to choke him, demanding, Pay back what you owe. Falling to his knees, his fellow servant begged him, Be patient with me, and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he had the fellow servant put in prison until he paid back the debt. Now when his fellow servant saw what had happened, they were deeply disturbed. And they went to their master and reported the whole affair. His master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you your entire debt because you begged me to. Should you not have had pity on your fellow servant as I had pity on you? Then in anger, his master handed him over to the torturers until he should pay back the whole debt. So will my heavenly Father do to you unless each of you forgives your brother from your heart. The Gospel of the Lord. You, this past week I was with the priest of Denver, Colorado on a, uh, uh, their priest retreat. And on the last night of the retreat, uh, typically what I do is with the priest, we have Alexio Divina on the gospel for this coming Sunday, today's gospel. Why? Because these priests all have to give a homily this weekend and to try to help them prepare for that. And I always find some very, very wonderful insights from these different priests. And one of the priests told us that uh, when he was a very young priest, there was a woman in his parish named Ruthie. They called her Ruthie. And she was very elderly when he was a young priest. And she, always, she was always very joyful, always serving and just always laughing, joyful. And, but he noticed that she always wore long sleeves. And he said, in one day, he said, we were at a parish dinner of some kind. We were all sitting around a table. And her sleeves were looser than usual. And he said, and she reached out to grab a dish, and he saw numbers tattooed on her arm. And he said, Ruthie, were you in a concentration camp? And she said, yes, Father, I was in Auschwitz. And he said, Ruthie, you never told us that. And he said, and you're always so joyful and you're always serving. There's a smile always on your face. You must have great pain in your heart and in your memory for the things you experienced and saw. And she said, Father, I learned a long time ago that I let that much anger into my heart. It will run 100 miles. So I have to live my life with joy because of what Jesus has done for me. I guess if I were to ask you, who is the one person who has hurt you the most in this world, most of us would be pretty quickly able to answer. 
And if you're not, consider yourself blessed. But I'd like to st- you to state that person, his or her name, silently to yourself. And as a spiritual exercise, I want you to imagine with your mind's eye, this comes from St. Ignatius' spiritual exercises, I'd like you to imagine that person standing right here, handcuffed, before the tribunal of God, waiting to be judged by Jesus. And that person is terrified, handcuffed. And Jesus looks at you and says, I will not judge him or her until I hear from you. Now, while you're thinking about that, I want to tell you something that happened to me when I was six years old. When I was a child, we lived on a farm, and there were two things that I loved to do on Sunday after Mass. One was to go fishing with my grandfather in the pond and his boat, and the other was to go horseback riding with my dad and had a little tiny pony. So one day I'm riding this little pony with my dad on Sunday afternoon, and we ride over the pond dam, and there was a tree with fruit on the tree. And my dad reaches out and grabs a piece of fruit, throws it in his mouth, and spat out the seed. And he said, oh, he said, Brett, these, this is delicious. You should try one. Now that was a persimmon tree. And he didn't bother to tell me that the one he had eaten was red and ripe. And I grabbed the lowest one, which happened to be green. Now, if you have ever had this experience, there is nothing more bitter in the world than a green persimmon. I mean, you will start spitting. It turns your mouth inside out. I literally got off the pony and was shoveling pond water in my mouth. At supper, it still tasted bad. And of course, my dad laughed and uh, gave me a ripe persimmon, which did help to to make it better. You know, many years later, when I was in the seminary, I coined my own theological word, persimmonism. And persimmonism is when a person has bitterness in their soul, and it turns their life upside down and they won't deal with it. They won't do what they need to do to forgive that person who has hurt them. I remember as a young priest, a man coming to see me once, very upset, and he was a construction, a very successful uh, builder, and he was telling me that he had done a big job and that, um, that the, man, the man he did the job for still owed him almost $100,000. And he said, and the job was finished, he went to collect his pay, and the man said, I don't have the money, and I can't borrow any more money. I can't pay you. And he said, you have to pay me. He said, I'm losing this money. And he said, I I don't have it. And he said, well, then just do me the favor of paying something every month. I don't care how much it is, but pay something. Show me that you care that this is unjust. And so the man agreed but he never paid a cent. And he never would return his phone calls. And then one day the man was in the airport and he saw this man that owed him so much money with his wife getting on a plane to Hawaii. He was very angry, he came to see me, he was so angry. And I guess you could say maybe they're extenuating circumstances, maybe it was a free trip. There's a lot of things that may be possible But the point was, mercy was shown to this man, and he did not respond by doing what was right, trying, at least making the effort. Everyone in this church has been offended or hurt by another person, and everyone in this church, starting right here with me, has offended God. And the difference between the two debts is astronomical. And if you read that gospel in the original languages, uh, Greek, you will see the numbers when it says uh, a much lesser amount, like five cent compared to a billion dollars in the money of that time. Literally, that was the difference in the debts. And the man refused him, forgave him a billion dollar debt, and he choked another man and put him in prison over a nickel. And the people who heard that gospel when Jesus spoke it would have understood clearly this is so evil. 
when mercy has been shown to you, not to show mercy to another. And the Lord ends this parable. Gosh, it's scary, isn't it? It's a parable, and he ends and he says, so will my Father do to you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. It's a scary gospel because forgiving another is so hard, isn't it? It's so hard. I think it's the most Christian thing we ever do. And we say, well, Father, I don't feel... No, I can't do it. I know you can't. You have to will it and let Jesus do it. But you have to will it. You have to say, I choose, Jesus, to forgive that person. I release him to your mercy, Jesus. He's handcuffed right here before the tribunal. I choose to forgive him or her, and I release him to your mercy. The greatest evil in the history of the world, no evil could ever come close, is theological deicide. What is deicide? It was the crucifixion and death of the God-man. And Jesus, this greatest evil, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. You know, I always say that you're coming to Mass. I'm so proud of you for being here to worship the Lord. And you know what? Kind of our coming to Mass on Sunday is kind of like making that weekly payment, isn't it? Kind of being present. And what do we say in the liturgy? It is, we say, uh, it is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and just. Because the debts are so staggeringly different. He has done so much for us. And that's why we come to thank him and praise him and ask his forgiveness and say, Jesus, I know I can never pay you back. It's not possible for what you've done for me, but I can at least say thank you. I can at least show up and say thank you, and I can at least try to forgive those who have hurt me. Even if you say, well, I can't do it. I know, but you can will it. And then you can say, Jesus, help me. And he will give you because you're right. You can't do it. Forgiveness requires grace. You can't do it without the grace of God. If you walk out this door when you leave and you look back up under the awning, you'll see in cast stone on the church the words in hoc signo vences in Latin. In this sign you will conquer Constantine the Great before he became the first Christian emperor the night before the Battle of Milvian Bridge. Constantine was praying to the Christian God. And Constantine saw a white cross in the sky, and he saw the letters, in hope, signo, vences, right? The same letters we have. In this sign, you will conquer. And the next day, he held all of his soldiers, painted a white cross on their shields, and they went into battle. And Constantine won that battle and became the first Christian emperor and in the Edict of Milan in 313, he made Christianity legal in the Roman Empire. In this sign, you will conquer. You'll never be able to forgive the person who hurts you except with the power of the cross. Jesus will give us that grace. So when I say we need to forgive another and this person who's here, you know, the little, we always teach people is to forgive another is to say, look, you say, well, I don't feel it. You don't have to feel it. You will it. And you look at Jesus and you see the person handcuffed here because they're about to be judged for, for very serious things. And you say, Jesus, I forgive him or her and I release him or her to your mercy. And Jesus says, okay, what you're saying is you're, this is no longer between you and this person. It's between me and this person. Yes, Jesus, that's what I'm saying. And then Jesus says, okay, I'm proud of you. I will take it from here. Now, how many times do you have to do that? About 33,000. You know what I mean? When there's a deep wound, one time is not enough, is it? We have to keep doing it. It's hard. But nothing will change your heart and get you ready for heaven like forgiving the person who has hurt you the most. Nothing will make you more Christ-like it may be the most important thing you ever do in your life is to forgive that person or person who hurt you so badly. And I know it's not easy. I know it's not an easy thing to think about. But it's what Jesus is asking of us. So let me be very clear before I end. 
To forgive an enemy, someone who has hurt you badly, does not mean you have to invite them to suffer. They may be a dangerous person, emotionally, physically, spiritually. However, you some people we forgive and love from a distance. Forgiveness does not mean you have to invite them into your home. And one last thing I want to be clear. To forgive another person and to release them to the mercy of God does not mean they get off scot-free. They will be held accountable for their sins. Mercy does not mean justice disappears. Mercy does not erase justice. It fulfills it. And I can't tell you I completely understand how this works, but I know it's true. Mercy does not erase justice. It brings it to fulfillment. What a great lesson I learned from that persimmon experience is that sometimes something that starts out so bitter ends up so sweet. And that's the power of forgiveness. Amen.